All right. Good evening, people. Welcome to our last session of day two. It's been a long and exciting day. We've had a diversity of presentations, very interesting topics, very uh, enriching um, performance. And um, we have the last one for today. It's a true honor for me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Aleida Lisette Linares Calix, with her presentation, The Post Method Era Rethinking the Language Teaching Profession. Dr. Linares is a professor of English with 25 years of teaching experience at UPNFM in Honduras. In 1995, she graduated from St. Michael's College in Vermont, USA, with a BA in TESL teaching English as a second language, as a part of the campus Fulbright Scholarship Program. In 2003, she graduated from Ohio University in the United States with a master's degree in education and a specialization in linguistics as a Fulbright LASPA recipient. In 2015, she obtained her PhD in applied linguistics as a recipient of Erasmus Mundus Scholarship Program from the University of Groningen, in the Netherlands. Currently, Dr. Linares is also a technical assistant of the Vice Rectory of Research and Graduate Studies at Universidad Pedagogica Nacional, Francisco Morazan. A true educational leader, a true mentor for many, and an inspiration for a lot more. With you, Dr. Aleida Linares. Thank you very much for such a nice presentation. Okay, I think it's a pleasure for me to be here and be part of the presenters of this um, 13 international conference for teachers of English that it's um, uh, sponsored by the Universidad Pedagogica Nacional and the American Embassy, um, including the Fulbright Association and, and some other um, organizations that also contribute to um, this uh, such an important event, probably the most important uh, professional development event that we hold, okay, um, in the language teaching department. So, of course, it's an honor to be here. And um, today, uh, I've decided to talk about a topic that is probably a, a, a very, a little bit controversial up to this point and probably not controversial, but yes, it can be also taken from uh, um, uh, opposite views or, or you can have different points of views or different perspectives. So I think it's very important to have like a lot of reflection about this and a lot of talking about this uh, because it's basically what, what the language teaching profession, it's moving towards, right, to, towards this direction. So I'm going to share my screen. I think, can you see it? Can you see the screen? Can you see the presentation? Yes, yes, it is clear. Oh. Yes. Oh. Okay, so my presentation is been entitled The Post Methods Era, Rethinking the Language Teaching Profession. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about the concept of um, the method, right? Uh, which is uh, some, it's, it's a term that all of us have been so familiar with. Um, and we can consider that that is probably one of the first uh, technical concepts, right, that we um, become familiar with when we start uh, studying, okay, about language teaching or language education. So for a long time, method has become in, in a part of the terminology of uh, second language teaching. It's been central in the language teaching profession. And it's probably one of the things that, that teachers uh, become so, um, 
uh, concerned about because it's something that we start, we, we learn, okay, as being important or central to the language teaching uh, practice, okay, we develop in the classroom. Um, however, uh, this term has become also problematic in the sense of bringing into the teaching profession a clear, okay, definition of it. There has been a problematic, okay, issue about understanding what really, what is method or what do we understand by method in the language teaching profession. So we can talk about two, okay, perspectives. One perspective is the one that comes from theorists or, or language specialists in the field and their conceptions and ideas. They propose Okay, their own ideas about, about the concept of method. And most of the time, the ideas that are proposed by theorists or, or specialists in the fields are the ones exactly that we find in the textbooks, okay? However, if we take into account the concept of method that teachers, okay, behold, um, it's, complete, it's something that comes from a completely different view. So teachers basically understand method as what they do in the classroom, okay? All the practices, okay, and behaviors that we have, okay, when we enter the classroom, all the applications and the practices, um, okay? Even, even beliefs, okay, that we have about teaching, then that is what we can also understand, okay, as method. There has been um, a distinction also between method and methodology, right? And we're going to talk about that. What is method and what is methodology? What is probably the relationship between them, okay? And how, do, how are they probably interpreted or understood, okay, by theorists and by um teachers, right? So I think it's important um, that to talk about something that Mackey, this very famous, okay, author in the language teaching field in, in 1965, Matt, uh, Mackey established that any meaning of method must first distinguish between what a teacher teaches and what a book teaches, okay? So it must not confuse the text used with the teacher using it or the method with the teaching of it. So we can we have we come to two distinctions here. Method analysis, which is the one, okay, is the is one thing, and then teaching analysis, which is another thing. What is method analysis? Method analysis is determined by how teaching is done by the book. And teaching analysis shows how much is done by the teachers. So that definition establishes two different, okay, views. One uh, is that method can be also understood as something that is prescribed by theorists and specialists in the field. And methodology, what uh, can also be understood from the perspective of the teacher. So we have two, two concepts, okay? Teaching analysis, which is based on analyzing classroom data and interpreting classroom data. And it's basically, okay, um, shaped by the classroom input and interaction and by the teacher intention and learner interpretation. Okay, while method analysis is the one that analyzes that the constituent features of a method or interpret the constituent features of a method is given by standard textbooks. And usually it, 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 it enterprises, okay, an analytical framework to analyze the method. So Kumaravati Bello, I'm going to be talking about this guy a lot today, comes or establishes the distinction that Method, methodology is usually the practical, okay, understanding, the practical thing, the practical, okay, um, knowledge that, that teachers have about classroom teaching. That is methodology. While method is something that is prescribed, okay, is given by the textbooks, and it's also provided or usually um, analyzed by a theoretical framework, okay?
So while one is prescriptive, the other one is descriptive. While one is, is theoretical, the other one is more practical, okay? Okay, there has been in the language teaching field, a distinction, a traditional distinction between approach, method, and technique. And we're going to refer here to Anthony Framework, who in 1963 tried to establish a distinction between these three concept, concepts in order to provide the teachers with an understanding of the language teaching um, operations or the language teaching process, okay? And then Anthony, Anthony explained that an approach uh, provided the theoretical assumptions uh, with what we explained, the nature of language and language teaching and learning, okay? And then he explained that the approach, which is understood as something very broad, okay? It's the gover governing principles of learning and teaching. And then for Anthony, approach was the umbrella by which method and techniques are okay, embraced in the classroom teaching. Um, then he explained the method comes okay, into a more um, probably um, operational uh, view. And then he said, okay, a method, it's an overall plan for the orderly presentation of language material, right? And the method, it's based on, on the approach, okay? And the approach is basically all the theoretical aspects, okay, that explain how we learn language or how we learn to learn, okay, languages. And then he says, okay, about technique. Then he said, okay, a technique then, it's part of the method. A technique is, is a, it's a procedural, okay, a, a trick, okay, or activity that it, it derives from the method or comes from the method. And it's basically um, a particular stratagem or contrivance, okay, with the purpose of accomplishing the learning objectives, right? So this is basically what we've been teaching to you guys in didactics uh, courses. And this has, this has been a very dominant view in the language teaching okay, field. However, there was a lot of criticisms and, and uh, um, divergence, okay, from this view because in, the, in in the classroom teaching, in actual classroom teaching, this was not, this distinction or this framework was not very helpful. Why was this view, okay, not very useful in order to understand, okay, how we accomplish method, okay, in the classroom? So I come to the first activity and I want you to write in the chat, um, some answers about what do you notice in the Anthony framework with respect to the definitions of approach, method, and technique, and their relationship, okay? I'm going to write, um, read the question again. I just want you to write your answers in the chat, okay? Or somebody can just jump in, okay, in the, um, um, Okay, uh, open your microphone and just jump in with the answer. I'm going to read the question again. What do you notice in the Anthony framework with respect to the definitions of approach, method, and technique and their relationship? Write your answer in the chat. I'm going to go back again to the framework so that you can read the definitions between approach, method, and technique. And then write down what do you think about, okay, the relationship, okay, between these uh, concepts according to Anthony framework, or what do you notice? Anything that you notice, okay, between these concepts and the relationship between them, you can write down, okay, in the chat and then just 
we're gonna get some help by reading the answers. Or anybody can also just open up the microphone and say um, whatever comes to your mind. So um, we're just, okay, brainstorming here, right? And, and talking about these concepts. Do we have any answer? I'm going to help you read them, yeah. Okay. One answer says, they relate to each other in terms of application order, we must work with them aligned. Uh, Ms. Dinora Rodriguez says they should be all considered but not confused by the time of teaching and designing our lessons. And Amilcar Nunez says approach is principles, method, it is based on the approach and methodology of particular activity. They're, they are closely related. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like an umbrella, I think. Okay, very nice. Very interesting, right? So somebody said, okay, they're kind of, they are interrelated, right? Okay, they are interrelated. They are important, okay, aspects or concepts to consider at the moment of, okay, planning our lessons or teaching. Uh, there is here an under, like a like an understanding that approach is like the umbrella, okay, term that embraces method and technique. Uh, somebody also mentioned that methodology it's it's like the um, uh, development the the activities okay we applied in the classroom method prob probably will be like a broader concepts right and methodology will be more related to the techniques that we applied in the classroom. Um, and somebody said, okay, they, they are interrelated, which is true, but they're not to be confused, okay, or used interchangeably, okay. Uh, and this is something I'm going to take into that, that um, I think, a comment into account because it answers. is true. Would yeah, there like are more answers. Reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Geraldine Rodriguez says approaches theoretical method, a set of procedures developed based on the theories, techniques, a stratagem used to reach an objective. Dania Canales says the approach is the overall view of the language. The method is like the process to follow and the technique is the particular activity to achieve the goals. And Ms. Digna Sevilla says, what I could catch is that the approach is a theory method, which is not attached to your presentation by the one I manage, is that it is the practical realization of an approach and technique is a classroom device or an activity. The approach is the big umbrella under which the others become part of. On the, yes, correct. Yeah. And I, mm -hmm. that's no one... One comes from the from the other, says Noemi Reyes in the last comment. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I think we have such a very uh, nice, I think, array of answers. And uh, I think the last one by uh, Ms. Sevilla, I think it's, it's great because it's what we have been, I think it's a predominant view, okay, in, in the language teaching field, right, to consider that the approach is like the theoretical perspective, or the philosophical view, right, of, of how teaching is supposed to be in the classroom. And then the method derives from that, okay, uh, theoretical perspective that most of the time has to do with behaviorism, okay, conductism, um, um, cognitivism, okay, uh, constructivism, okay, and so on. And then we have such, also we have had like a cascade of methods, okay, that have invaded the field. And sometimes uh, those methods are very difficult also to implement in the classroom because some, they have such a variety of principles, right, and, and techniques that sometimes it's very difficult like to, to um, determine, okay, where those techniques come from or how they are supposed to be applied in the classroom. And um, I would like to say that the answers that you have given 
they provide some kind of uh, their their true, okay. So um, they reflect that there are a variety. There is a variety of interpretations, right, about what we understand by these concepts in the language teaching field, and that has been basically one of the most problematic things, right, in the field that we have not been able to exactly divine, define or determine what a method is, right? And how we implement, okay, this concept or terminology into the classroom. Most of the time we start thinking about a method from the very beginning of the language course, okay? And then we end up finishing by applying, okay, uh, such a variety of activities that we don't even know if that was the method we started working with, or that it's a combination of several different principles, right, or practices at the end. And this is this has been one of the most um, uh, overwhelming, okay, um, facts or things, okay, that has shaped, okay, the language teaching field. Uh, I'm going to hold on to that and move on to the next framework. And then, say that the the discussion in the field okay and the um happiness how can i say dissatisfaction okay there was a lot of dis dissatisfaction about this theoretical framework okay and then because it's basically i didn't provide it a very clear distinction between approach and method and then there was another problem distinguishing between method and technique at somehow Method and technique were also understood like classroom practices, uh, and they were understood almost interchangeably at some point. Some other people think that approach and method are also interchangeably, interchangeably, and they started using them almost in the same way or at the same level, right? That was another problem. And then the language teaching, also this framework uh, proposes that the language teaching process is somehow hierarchical. Right, that we start from the approach, then we go to the we go to the method, and then we go to the technique. Okay, while in reality, in the in the classroom, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, these all of these aspects are interconnected, right? But they move all, and they are also affected by other factors that are external most of the time, that are institutional also okay for example the teaching the language teaching process is also affected by the teacher roles and the student roles most of the time also this process is affected by or influenced by the teaching style and the learning style of the students other most of the time also everything that we do in the classroom is affected by the institutional conditions right societal factors um resources resources okay available in the in, in institutional level and so on and so on what i'm trying to say is that the language teaching process cannot be determined as something hierarchical but rather than that it's something interdynamic okay that it's a, a process that it's mostly seen as a construction Okay, as a social construction rather than something menial or something static, right? And then we got to the next framework proposed by Richards and Rogers in 1982, which also we talked a lot about these guys in didactics, in our didactic courses. And then Richards and Rogers says, okay, Anthony framework enough. It's not sufficient. It, it has its flaws, right? Um, and then we need to talk about approach, design, and procedure. Now there are th two other concepts that are okay included in this conceptualization we're trying to make about method, right? And then Richards and Roger said, okay, we should talk about approach. Approach are the assumptions, beliefs, and theories about nature of language and language learning that provides a theoretical foundation for classroom teaching. So this view is very similar to the one that Anthony Frank were proposed, right, in the 1960s. But Richards and Rogers didn't believe as method, didn't believe in the concept of method as something, okay, 
in between approach and procedures. They believe that method was more an umbrella term, an umbrella term that embraces the theoretical aspects of teaching and the practical aspects, aspects of teaching. And they proposed a new concept, design. So they, they said, okay, we need to talk about design. What is design? Is a relationship between the theories of language and learning, which results in classroom materials and teaching activities. So for them, design was more in a procedural kind of stage, okay, between the approach and everything that has to do with the syllables. Okay, so for them, design has to do more, more with the syllables content, okay, classroom um, ma uh, materials and how in, in the activities, okay, that we applied in the classroom. And then they said, okay, there's, there, uh, there's another concept we, we should take into account, procedure. We had technique before, now they said, okay, we should talk about procedure. What is procedure? Procedure is the, are the classroom techniques and the practices which are the consequences of particular approaches and designs. See, still they're very, they're giving a very broad uh, perspective about procedure. They're talking more about teacher, teacher roles, student roles, okay, teaching activities, okay, based on the approach that is chosen by the teacher, right? And based on the syllabus design, right? So you can see that there, there are more, there is an integration of other aspects, right? Uh, that were not integrated before in the Anthony's framework. And these aspects are like more interrelated, right? One to another one, but still, but still, there is something like a confusion and there is something like, like more subjective into this framework. So we get to the activity number two. What do you notice in the revised framework by Richards and Rogers with respect to the definitions of approach, design and procedure and their relationship? Or what is different between what is new, okay, between Richards and Rogers framework and Anthony um, framework. I'm going to, okay, write down your answers in the chat. Okay, again, uh, and I'm going to show the framework again so that you can refresh, okay, some ideas. Now we're going to, com well, we're going to compare this one and say, okay, what do you notice in the revised framework by Richards and Rogers with respect, with respect to definitions of approach, design, and procedure in their relationship? Or what is new? Anybody can. Do we have any answers? Not yet. I think people are typing right now. <laughs> Ms. Fabiola Calero says, once again, the three of them are related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More people must be typing right now. Uh, Mr. Ramon Romero says, attitudes and beliefs also affect planning significant, significantly. Moreover, teachers shouldn't Im implement just one method, but as many as needed in terms of having enough techniques in the class. We have one from English conference. Approach keeps the same method, on the other hand, becomes more practical than in Anthony's, and it gives a better understanding for material role, materials, roles, and participants' roles in the process. Procedure becomes the practicality of the procedures proposed by the design. Hmm. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I think I um I like that answer because we can tell that in in this framework, okay, Richards and Rogers are probably more oriented to a classroom issues, right? And they they talk about more about the syllabus, okay, content. 
and in pedagogical aspects of teaching, right? Includes, and that is true, include the teacher's attitudes, the teacher um, interaction, okay, with the student in the classroom. That is true. They take into account also the teacher's interaction in the classroom, the student's interaction in the classroom too, uh, the, the role of the teacher, the role of the students, okay, in the classroom, it's are important. Um, and also they talk about the practicalities, right, of the classroom techniques and, and how or, or those classroom techniques are taken into account in the classroom. How do we apply them and where they come from, okay? Uh, and, and what do they have to do with the design, okay, of, of the class? That is true. Uh, and of course, these three concepts are again interrelated, but we still have some kind of subjectivity going around here, right? Again, and then um, we come, okay, uh, to just review, uh, according to Richards and Rogers, approach is basically kept very similar to the same idea as Anthony. Framework method is used more as an umbrella term. In this, they understand method more as the relationship between the theoretical and the practical aspects of the classroom. Very different from Anthony's okay, perspective. Design, design substitute the term method in this approach and includes content of instruction, learning roles, teacher roles, and instructional materials. And then procedure. Procedure specifies the context of use and the outcomes. It includes the types of teaching and learning techniques and the type of exercises and practice activities and the resources, right? Okay, but then that this hasn't resolved the problem of defining exactly what method is, and still, in the language teaching field, we still find that method has not been understood in a similar way, but has a different kind of interpretations, right? According to the framework that we have, we're going to give the method some kind of interpretation or another one. Okay, that's something that I want you to probably keep in mind. And then, we have to we have come to a point and in which we have to rethink the process and then we need to stop and think about okay what else we have these theoretical frameworks okay that have uh influenced the language teaching field uh and they have interpreted method okay under a, a different kind of perspectives but still it hasn't been clarified and it hasn't been helpful to the teachers in order to understand exactly how we're going to apply the method, how we're going to choose a method in the classroom, and how we're going to evaluate, okay, the methods that we applied in the classroom. If we don't have, okay, like a clear understanding of what a method is or a clear definition of it. So it's very difficult, right? To, to come to a clear cut definition of what method or methodology is. However, we try to give some kind of, okay, orientation about it. And then the, it, there is this guy, Kamara Badivelu, okay, in 2006. And then he proposes that there should be a post-method era, a post-method pedagogy because there has been deficiencies at defining the concept of method and integrating uh, the framework into the language teaching process in the classroom, right? And I think I agree with Kamara Vadivelo, right? Because I also have been teaching for a long time, right, uh, into the UPN, and most of maybe uh, some of, of the audience here have been maybe my students, now teachers, now professionals, right? And I think that in the in the classroom, sometimes we have difficulties making the students understand what is a method, okay? And how do we exactly make a difference between a method and approach? And when are we going to apply communicative language teaching in the classroom? And when 
it's going to be clear that we're going to apply communicative language teaching different from direct method, audiolingual method, right? Cooperative learning approach. Uh, and okay, this has been somehow very difficult to, to teach and also very difficult for students, for teaching students to understand. And I think that it's something um, understandable. It's something comprehensible that these concepts are very abstract, very like, okay, in, in, in the space somehow, right? Um, very difficult to understand, assimilate and to make them, okay, applied in the classroom under a particular set, okay, of principles. Uh, that's, that has to do a lot with lesson planning, okay, which is something else that I'm going to talk probably later on. How lesson planning relates to the method, why is it so difficult, okay, for our students to connect, okay, lesson planning to okay, it's something I think they're interesting that we need to take a look at. But then Camara Vadivelo, okay, discusses and criticizes, criticizes the concept of method and says, okay, method has been a concept that has been imposed uh, onto the teachers for, okay, specialists in the field. And they have their own conceptions about method and they have imposed onto the teachers their own ideas about methods, okay? Um, and then there has been, he says, a tendency to separate the different levels of organization where language teaching should be seen as, as an interdependent system. We tend to separate approach, method, technique, okay? Or approach, uh, a design procedure. We, take, we tend to separate them or to look at them as, di as different levels of organization and they're connected, but somehow they are interdependent, more interdependent. They should be seen as an interdependent system right, somehow, rather than different levels of organization or hierarchical aspects, okay, of teaching. So the proposed frameworks are supposed to be, uh, have come to be unreliable and subjective. Uh, approach has been as theory or come, coming from the researcher activity. Design has, has been more uh, understood as syllabus designer and materials producer. And procedure has been more like a classroom teacher or learner activity, something little, right, that we applied as an activity in the classroom or as a technique in the classroom. Um, and not, not something that is informed, okay, by the method probably or the approach. Um, and then we got, with that perspective, Ian, I'm not clarifying anything, probably I'm just making you more confused about this stuff. We come to the point of the correct view about the necessity probably or the, the tendency, okay, to move towards a post method, okay, understanding. And then this same guy says, okay, that um, it's important to look at two things when understanding method, okay? Then it says, okay, we should stop, okay, looking at method under these so many constructs or definitions. And we need to look, look at the method under two perspectives. One is principles, okay? What are the principles? It's a set of insights derived from theoretical and applied linguistics cognitive psychology, information sciences, and other related disciplines that inform the field. Includes everything that has to do with the syllabus design, materials production, and evaluation measures. So Kumarabati Velu says, okay, we need to understand method more under the perspective of principles, which is for him, principles is like all the theoretical aspects that come from the research-based, okay, um, uh, fields and the ones that also inform or determine how we construct the syllabus, how we make materials, and how we evaluate, okay, uh, learning. And then he says, okay, procedures. Another way to understand method is through procedures, right? What are procedures? By 
for Comaravá Velo, procedures are classroom events, activities, and techniques. And then he says, okay, just by looking at these two aspects, okay, we are going and we are going to understand how we apply methods in the classroom, okay, or what we, uh, what our understanding of method is, right? I think it's it's more simple. I think Kumarabadi Velu simplifies the frameworks a lot, in my opinion, right? But I think that it would be useful, right? If we take a look at this perspective, because maybe he's more teacher oriented than theoretical, okay, oriented. And then we come to the post method pedagogy. And then uh, the post method pedagogy it's important to understand post-method pedagogy from the critical pedagogy perspective that look at the methods as colonial constructs conceptualized by theories and not understood from the teacher's perspective right uh, in the classroom. So post-method is seen as a post-colonial construct from the bottom up that is constructed from the way teachers work in the classroom. It's contextualized teaching and curriculum uh, that it's it may it, it, it moves away from marginalization. What marginalization is? Marginalization has to do with the ideological aspects of teaching, of language teaching that are imposed by most important theories in the field under okay teachers' constructions and practices in the classroom. So teaching which is not based on prescriptions and procedures dictated by a particular method or uh, nor which follows a particular syllables, it's called post-method. So post-method has more to do with the teacher's individual understandings of language, language learning theories, and practical knowledge and skills, interests, and learning styles. So I want to clarify that uh, I'm not saying here that every teacher can, uh, can, can build, okay, his own method, right? or that every teacher should be teach according to, okay, what he thinks, okay, in the classroom. Uh, Post-method pedagogy has its own framework, okay, and some principles. And one of them is particularity. Particularity has to do with the teachers and learners as co-explorers, right? Engaged in a dialogue-based relationship about syllabus content, materials, right, um, evaluation, and uh, also it has to do with uh, student may it believes in the building of materials based on the curriculum context of the school, okay, or the institution, more than package materials, more than textbook based, okay, curriculum. It believes in the production of materials by the teacher and the students based on the curriculum context, okay, of, okay, the institution. And also, believes in narrative approaches to teaching and learning. What does it mean, narrative approaches? That we need to talk about the processes of teaching. We need to talk about how do we teach? What do we do in the classroom? How do we teach our students? We need to talk about, okay, what would be the best practices for our students to learn? We need to talk about the syllabus content. We need to talk about uh, the, the best or not very best practices in the classroom. We need to talk about how do we approach evaluation. We need to talk about how do we approach particular techniques, okay, in the classroom. We need to build on narrative um, approaches. And it also believes some policies as bottom-up and context-based. It means that policies must come from what we do in the classroom with the students, right, and build upon that in order to Okay, move up to okay the latter stage. Practicality. It's another principle of pedagogy that talks about the relationship between theory and practice, autonomy, reflective teaching and action research, critical thinking skills and knowledge, and context sensitive pedagogy uh, pedagogic uh, knowledge. What does it mean? Practicality. That teaching must be based on the context. And we should build our curriculum based on the situation of learning, based on what the experiences are, and then move from there into more reflective teaching and practice and take those students to autonomy learning, right? Um, and then we get to the possibility. 
factor. The possibility talks about power in inequality, uh, empowering teachers and empowering students. It talks a little bit more about Freire pedagogy, pedagogia de Paulo Freire, if you remember, and it's more into critical thinking, critical pedagogy, autonomous learning, building, probably talking about, okay, very transforming kind of practices in, in the classroom, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to take to a point that we can talk about risks at adopting a post-method pedagogy. You can tell, okay, but the, there are some risks about this kind of revolutionary pedagogy or rethinking the method, right? To a point, what are those risks that we can take at, at applying or trying to implement this pedagogy? Is that there may be too much freedom of choice and then the teacher can start get to a point where he builds his own method style and thinking that it's okay to have my own method style and that Mr. Mohe has his own method style and then, and then uh, Dr. Rijoa, her own method style, right? Uh, and maybe there might be this interpretation of a Jumanji combination of methods and techniques in the classroom and going everywhere or a jungle probably. And uh, there might be some limitations on teachers' applications of methods and techniques because maybe of lack of understanding of so many techniques or maybe there might be some chaos and difficulty to measure results or evaluate learning if we're going everywhere, right? If we're going all over the place. Uh, we're not promoting that. Uh, um, what it's important to also understand is that the new methods pedagogy uh, moves to, towards an understanding that classroom is situated, is context-based, context and that we applied in that methods are supposed to be adapted, okay, to the students' learning and situations, and that we need to be informed about that. It's not that whatever comes into place or whatever I want to do, it's fine. No, it has to be based on research. It has to be based on reflective thinking, okay, and it has to be based on also um, a new role of teachers as reflective practitioners. Uh, and then a new role of learners as critical thinkers. And then that probably would lead to the empowerment of classroom as situated place of teaching. What does it mean classroom as situated place of teaching? That the classroom is something dynamic, that we cannot apply the same method all the time because it requires changing, adaptation, right? To the new um, needs. Okay, of learners to the new needs of the teacher, to the new needs of the institution. So we need to be reflecting about that and to be changing and adapting that in an inform, okay, based, not in a personal way, not in a personal base, not on what I want to do because that's what I feel like, or that's what I think that it's correct, but based on reflection, right? And in reflection in, 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 a, in a community, right? Macro strategies are so, so okay. How can we probably apply okay this pedagogy? Uh, Kumaraba Develu proposes macro strategies, okay, suggested. Um, and then oh, he says, okay, we need to maximize learning opportunities. We need to provide students with okay, a random, uh, I mean, uh, a big array, okay, of, of learning opportunities. There might be also, we need to facilitate negotiated interaction in the classroom. Uh, we need to promote learner autonomy. Um, and of course, we need to teach students how to become autonomous, right? By giving them strategies, not by making them more dependable on the teacher, right? But giving them more strategies about how to become autonomous. I, I find very difficult, even though we have come from the pandemic times that students are become autonomous uh, and, and this should be another issue, but it's important to move to, towards that direction. Foster language awareness. Students need to be given opportunities to analyze language, to become observers of language, to investigate what, what, what are their mistakes, 
Why do they make so many mistakes in pronunciation, for example? We have students that have problem pronunciation problems, but they don't realize that they have pronunciation problems. So it's, it's because I think there are difficulties for students to become aware, okay, that they have, they have such difficulties in language because we need more awareness, right? Of, of metalinguistic thinking, okay, or analysis of language or analysis of students' own uh, proficiency levels, okay? Integrated, integrate language skills. We need to be integrated in four language skills all over the place, all over the curriculum, all over the program. Ensure social relevance, okay? The curriculum must be social relevant and culturally based, okay? So that our students feel that we are relating to the learning, the learning to their lives, to their needs, right? Uh, and then I think I'm getting towards the end finally, and then we can have some uh, talk, okay? Uh, how we can land to the realities of our classroom, how we can make this pedagogy and understanding a post method, okay, land, how we can lend it, okay? To the classroom. Well, I think that one of the things we, we need to do and we are forced to do is to develop and strengthen communities of learning for teachers and learners. We need to develop academic networkings, okay? Uh, we need to start thinking and reflecting, okay, in communities, within communities built by respect, right? And academic, okay, um, objectives, right um and we need also to use mentoring uh to 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 help okay junior teachers come into the profession field right and start building on their competences and start transmitting right this generational knowledge okay into the junior ones so that we can start building on these concepts and ideas about methods what are my methods what are your methods, right? What do we understand but that methodology? How do we put it into the classroom, okay? Um, and uh, we need to develop reflective meetings to tackle classroom teaching and syllabus implementation from an academic perspective, right? Uh, we need to stop complaining and giving complimentary rewards for small actions to the students. Uh, we don't need to congratulate students for saying or saying or greeting into the classroom or bringing the homework, right? We need to build the students into more probably challenging situations where they can build on their own learning and feel, okay, accomplished, okay, by real learning in the classroom, not by little things, right, that they're supposed to do in the classroom. And so we are rewarding all the time because the student is greeting in English, okay? So congratulations, you're doing a good job, right? So we need to move students into meaningful learning, into real life learning in the classroom and pushing them, right? Into more uh, probably um, uh, uh, meaningful kinds of learning or challenging, right? Learning so that they feel that they really meet the goals, right, in the classroom. Think of, uh, think of narratives to document the process of reflection. Think of narrative, what do I mean by that? We need to think of ways to document what we are doing in the classroom. We need to write maybe teachers journals, right? Uh, we need to teach our students to take the learning the, uh, journals, right? Uh, we need to do portfolios to write about that. We need to write letters maybe to each other and so on and so on. We need to promote learner autonomy by using virtual platforms in an intelligent way and developing classroom materials with their help and participation. Um, stop using handouts from the internet, okay? I think that we can be more creative uh, than that and we need to push students to be more creative towards developing uh, learning materials, teaching materials. Be ready for constant criticism and discussion of classroom practices and results. If we move to a post-method pedagogy, we need to be ready for criticism. We need to take it, I think, in a more resilient way when it comes, when it has an academic perspective and not a personal one, right? So we need to be ready for criticism all the time because we're moving from Okay, trans from pedagogies that are traditional to pedagogies that are more, I think, 
a, a post-modernist right, uh, uh, perspectives or methodologies. And finally, a post-method perspective requires a lot of research and reflection and also constant appraisal of results, okay? So thank you very much. I think finally I have finished. And finally, I can I can hear your questions or your comments. Thank you, Dr. Linares. Uh, I was rushing, so I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> we, we couldn't tell. Um, this is a great topic to discuss and reflect about. And we have some questions. We have, if we can answer them, like in a TV show in 20 seconds, that would be awesome because we have like six. <laughs> Principles help us to plan based on the methodology, right? That's the first one. Principles help us. Principles help us to plan based on based the methodology. On, well, principles probably will be based if if I look at Kumaravati Veldu's approach. Principles are not methodology. They're, they're more general theoretical aspects of teaching. And the principles lead to the methodology. Principles lead to methodology, according to Kumaravati Bell. Methodology, it's more what the teacher does in the classroom. How the teacher implements uh, the, the, teacher, the practices in the classroom and how do we apply them in the classroom, that's methodology. That's just, just very quick because that was my question but the thing is that when i was teaching a class based on didactics uh we were looking at the book uh tblt by david noonan and uh it is based on tblt or task-based teaching right mm -hmm. and he suggests seven principles to apply the methodology properly or accurately mm -hmm. so that's why that's my question right that it is not exactly principles or the methodology itself, but they oh. help help you to guide to apply the methodology oh. accurately, right? Oh, oh, yes, yes, right, right, right. Principles are not the methodology, but they actually guide the teachers, right, okay. to apply the, me the methodology based on some general principles that mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. uh, I think um, and um, help understand Okay, issues related to language learning, okay, in a better way. Principles are most of the time connected to language learning, okay, how we learn languages and how we apply language teaching okay. in the class. Thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot, doctor. Uh, question two, for what level do you think will be like more suitable to adopt this post-method pedagogy? Post-method pedagogy, I would say the post-method pedagogy requires a lot of experience and critical thinking on, on the side of the teacher because uh, at the very beginning when teachers are, are um, new to the field, um, there is more difficulty to, to um, adapt methods right to the classroom because there is less experience with all the complexities that are going on in the classroom. The more experienced a teacher becomes, the more I would say prepared he or she will be to a post-method approach in the classroom because this requires a lot of experience and, and, and uh, critical thinking about your own teaching practices. And the teacher needs to be more mature about criticizing your own teaching style, about moving away from traditional practices into more innovative ones or practices that are more influenced by the teaching context. That requires some kind of, uh, I think, uh, a lot of um, knowledge about uh, teaching methodologies, knowledge about, okay, uh, teaching practices in the classroom, knowledge about the students, also how the students learn and how the students behave, and knowledge about institutional issues that are also sometimes institutional issues affect a lot the way we teach because we move into a curriculum that it's surrounded by okay internal and external aspects and the more experienced the teacher about the more knowledgeable about those issues classroom based issues and institutional issues i think the more oriented the teacher can be to oppose method 
I don't think new teach, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm maybe um, underestimating, okay, teacher, new teachers can be also very knowledgeable. Uh, but I think that uh, moving to a post method requires that kind of uh, re uh, reflection and, and knowledge about how you are moving into your teaching context, how how good you okay you are at at that teaching context, and and what are you allowed to do, and what you are not allowed to do, okay, in terms of your teaching methods. That's a beautiful answer that but smoothly leads to Dr. Gloria Ulloa's question and says um, that sometimes it seems that teachers are so reluctant to read research on everything that's going on in the field of teaching. So she asks, how can a, how can a teacher become a practitioner of these new ways of teaching? Could writing their narrative be a good way to have a a head start to reading research? Yes, that's what I believe. I, th I think Dr. Ujoa just gave right, okay, uh, into the target. Okay, something that we need to start doing is writing narratives. I think it's building on narratives. It's writing what we do in the classroom. It's becoming narrators, okay? Uh, it's telling ourselves probably what we do in the classroom and then talking between us, talking among, okay, us and reflecting about those stories. Let's call them stories, right? Let's build on our stories. And then we become storytellers, right? And then we can write about those stories. And, and then we can publish. We can even write, and maybe we can publish articles about those narratives because from those narratives, they we can start learning a lot from it, from the way we teach in the classroom. And that's how we can start validating a new methodology, right? Uh, that's that maybe we've been applying in the classroom, but that we, because we haven't written about it, because we haven't talked about it, then it have, we don't know, okay, that it's going on, that we don't know maybe that we, that there is a new methodology that we are implementing Okay, and that it can be successful, but because we haven't been able to write about it or we haven't been able to talk about it, then we cannot establish as something that it, it can function or that's something valuable, right, in our context. So I think we can start building on narratives, right, to start building a, a methodology. Yeah. Perfect. And it, it says in a comment like the articles we read in forum. They are usually teaching experiences. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I was for... telling I was telling my students in in uh, literature didactics last a few Saturdays ago that uh, it's shocking that I could go and ask many teachers around me what their teaching philosophy is, and they don't have one. They don't know what to say, and and I think that's uh, that's something that tells us that we're not clear. Because approaches, methods, and, and, and everything that we have available to develop lessons in different areas uh, are just tools. Like, like we choose them from a menu uh, according to the context that we're going to be teaching in. Mm -hmm. And um, I think policy makers are not taking into account a lot of the scientists, the the experts, the experts in the academic field, uh, results of their research in order to make new decisions to improve the, the quality of education. So that could be a little discouraging sometimes uh, mm -hmm. for researchers because they, they come with these, these huge research uh, projects that they have done and they bring amazing results. They, they, they have a lot of data gathered but policymakers are not paying attention to that when they are making educational policies so that could be something that might need to start changing soon mm -hmm. right and sometimes policymakers are just interested in commercializing textbooks probably because that's a big business business sorry mm-hmm this is uh, an interesting but confusing topic at the same time due to the myriad of theories, says Karen Viana. 
Uh, yes, because it, yeah. it's so much, it's so broad and, and vast that you have to start organizing. It's about writing your narrative. That was a beautiful conclusion that both of you doctors came up with. Um, writing your own narrative to come up with mental clarity on where you're going and what you want to be as a mm -hmm. teacher and what you want your students to get from you. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot, Dr. Linares. Thank you very much to all the audience members that were uh, that attended this session. It's the last session on, of day two. Uh, tomorrow, we have our final lap. Beautiful, beautiful presentations tomorrow. We're going to end up with a panel with the three uh, with three experts at 11 a.m. And we have um, sessions from 8 a.m. up to 11 a.m. So we hope to see you again tomorrow. Uh, check the Sway out and get the links from there so you can connect to sessions tomorrow. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Thanks for attending. Thank you, doctor. You're such an inspiration. Good night. <laughs>